If I asked you to name a serial killer, several infamous names may immediately spring to mind. You might think of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, or even John Wayne Gacy, but I can almost guarantee you did not think of the name Stephen Graveson. Stephen Graveson was a British serial killer who was active throughout the 90s, and if it weren't for the families of the victims really pushing police for answers, he could have got away with murder. Just going to quickly apologise in advance before we get into the video that I literally only have one opportunity to film this video this week and today is also the day my neighbour has decided to cut their grass so if you hear your racket or anything in the background I am really sorry. Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. If you're new here, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. If you've watched one of my videos before, thank you for coming back and sitting and listening to another one. I really appreciate your continuous support. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe and hit the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. Before listening to today's video, please make sure to check the description box below for any trick warnings. This is the case of a serial killer who was dubbed the Sunderland Strangler, Stephen Greveson. Stephen John Greveson was born in Sunderland in the northeast of England on the 14th of December 1970. He is one of seven children to Kathy and Terry Greveson. He has three brothers, Terry, Wayne and Alan, and then three sisters, Samantha, Catherine and Leanne. They all live together on Roker Avenue and some would describe some members of the family as troublesome. Terry would be extremely abusive and violent towards Kathy. He had no problem beating her in front of their kids. Stephen and his siblings would often witness their mother being hit and beaten multiple times from a very young age and sadly this became quite a normal thing in their household. Kathy would always retaliate and she would never back down to Terry so when he hit her she would swing right back and give just as much as she got. Kathy and Terry eventually ended up separating and from what I could find after the separation Terry completely dropped out of his kids' life and left Kathy a single mother to seven. At 11 year old Stephen began getting into trouble with the police. One of his first incidences was when he had gone into a shop, opened up a packet of nails, took one nail out and walked out with it stealing it, leaving the open packet on the shelf. I don't know what his intent was or why he just wanted one singular nail but I can't imagine it was for anything good. The shop owner reported this theft to police and it eventually made its way up to court. Stephen only really got a slap on the wrist for this offence but I think everyone was kind of hoping that this would, you know, scare him a little bit to prevent him from getting into more trouble but obviously it didn't or we wouldn't be here today. Over the next few years, Stephen would continuously get into more and more bother with police for petty crime and he began abusing drugs. He was sniffing glue from 11 year old. Because he was continuously getting into so much trouble, Stephen was put onto a care plan by the social services who removed him from his home and then placed him in like a boarding school type thing in Carlisle when he was 13. Later talking about this, Kathy would say, quote, I felt bad when he was sent away, like I might not have brought him up properly. It wasn't just him, my oldest also had gone into care. I wasn't always there for them because I used to go to the bingo and that. Here Stephen began getting into football and he was described as a naturally talented player. He played for a club which was called Clipper FC and it seemed that he was making progress. However, there was a switch in Stephen and this happened after he was sexually and physically abused while at the school. It really knocked all of his progress back and he sadly never really came back from it. Unbeknownst to the adults around him, he had begun doing sex work in order to fund his newly ignited drug addiction. He would later say that while doing this work, he was raped by much older men and their friends, sometimes many of them at once. In a review that was written by a social worker when Stephen was 15, it said, quote, Stephen gives the impression of an emotionless boy, showing little concern for anything. He spends little time with his family when away from the school. He spends most of his time with a circle of friends, most of whom are involved in delinquency, and he has little supervision from his parents. A review from the following year said, quote, Stephen is a nervous, insecure boy who has little stability from his background or from within himself. He has a very low opinion on himself. 
and a report from the school described Stephen as being an emotionless boy who lacked empathy, was callous and had no insight into the trouble that his behaviour caused. When he turned 18, Stephen left the boarding school and returned back to Sunderland and back to old habits. He would fill his days by sniffing glue, smoking weed and stealing cars. The family home would be subject to almost weekly raids and searches because of Stephen Stephen and this created a ton of friction between him and Kathy. She would shout at him and scream at him but he just didn't care. By the time he was 19 in 1989, Stephen had racked up up to 38 offences and spent the odd weeks and months in and out of prison. He never really served like a long sentence though. Overall, he was a very disliked person throughout Sunderland. He was known to be a bully. He would pick on younger boys and pensioners. He was a troublemaker and really he was an outcast. He really struggled to retain any friends. I didn't really know where to put this when talking about Stephen's early life, so I'm just gonna put it here. But throughout his teen years, Stephen really struggled with his sexuality and coming to terms with it. And he felt a lot of embarrassment and shame from his sexuality. He did have the odd relationships here and there with girls. However, Kathy would say that he never really liked them and she had always known that Stephen was gay. Now this is in the northeast of England in the early 90s and being part of the LGBTQ plus community was not as accepted as it is now. Back then, especially in a place like Sunderland, there was very much an expectation on what a man was, how he looked, how he acted, how he dressed, obviously who he dated and anything outside of that expectation could essentially make you a target, put a target on your back for you to be bullied and for people to treat you differently. So Stephen tried to suppress his sexuality, which would turn him lethal. Friday the 26th of November, 1993 was a day as normal as any other. 18 year old Thomas Kelly had left his family home to go to college, which was in the local town. His younger sister, Lindsay, distinctly remembers Thomas affectionately touching her head before he left the house that morning. They lived in Roker in the pit houses and they had a very close knit community and Thomas was very well liked. He was a familiar face to many in and around the area because he had once worked as a paper boy so he would go out and deliver newspapers. Thomas would always go the extra mile though if he delivered a newspaper to like a lonely elderly person. He would sit and chat with them, he would keep them company for a bit. If anyone needed anything picking up from the shop and they couldn't go themselves Thomas would be the first person to offer to go for them. He was just really kind and he was just natured like that. Thomas would be described as a very young 18 year old who always looked out for other people. He was helpful and would do anything for anyone. Alongside delivering newspapers, Thomas would also work with the police helping them out. He would go and stand in the line. So you know when a crime happens and they've got like eight men stood and the witness of whatever crime has to point and be like, that's the man. Thomas would help the police out and he would go and stand in these lineups. It was here that he had one of his first interactions with Stephen Greveson. Both men were stood in a lineup for a burglary that Stephen had committed. And somehow Stephen had decided that Thomas was the one who, in his own words, quote, shopped him up. So after he made this decision based off literally nothing, he threatened Thomas saying that he was going to kill him. Now remember, Stephen is not a nice guy. He very much has a reputation. He's four years older than Thomas. At this point in time, Stephen is 22 years old. So when he made this threat to Thomas, it really genuinely scared him. So Thomas just kept out of the way of him. On this day, on the 26th of November, 1993, Thomas got the bus back from college and he and Stephen coincidentally ended up on the same bus. Details from here are a bit foggy, but somehow Stephen either managed to convince or lure Thomas to some allotments in Fulwell, which you can see is not very far from Roker, where Thomas lived. It's believed that Stephen had made a sexual advance towards Thomas and when Thomas hastily declined, like, no, I don't want to do that, Stephen just filled with fury. 
He wasn't only angry that he had been rejected, but he felt a deep embarrassment over it. Also now Thomas knew about Stephen's sexuality and Stephen was so paranoid about being outed. So in Stephen's mind, the only way he can silence Thomas is to kill him. And he does so by strangling Thomas with his own scarf. In order to try and conceal the murder, Stephen had left Thomas's body inside the allotment and then set it on fire. When Judy, Thomas's mum, got home that afternoon and found that her son wasn't home, it was a bit unusual. She walked through the house to the kitchen to see if maybe he had left her a little note saying where he was. This is what the Kelly family would do if they were going to be late or if they were staying back somewhere. They would write almost, you know, like a little post-it note and keep it on the table so that the other members of the family could see. Again, this is in the very early 90s, so mobile phones are not a great big thing yet. But there was no note from Thomas and Julie couldn't recall him mentioning that it was going to be in any later than he usually would. The Kellys didn't even have a house phone so she couldn't even ring around Thomas's friends' house to see if maybe he was there. So she and little Lindsay began walking the streets, kind of walking Thomas's route to see if he was stuck somewhere chatting or hanging around or anything like that but there was no sign of him. Trying not to worry, I mean, Thomas was an independent 18 year old man and if he wanted to stay out later, he could. Judy wasn't an overbearing mother. So she now thought maybe he's popped into the pub and he's having a couple of pints with his dad, Tommy. Surely that's where he is. But later on in the afternoon when Tommy had came home and Thomas wasn't with him, they just couldn't understand where he was or why he wasn't home. That night, Judy and Tommy waited up all night, listening out for Thomas's keys, sliding in the lock and him walking through the door, but he never did. The next morning, the Kellys tried to go on as usual, hoping that Thomas would appear soon. They were watching the news when they heard a broadcast about an unidentified body being found in a nearby allotment. Tommy's head fell into his hands and Julie just felt as if she'd been punched in the stomach. Thomas hadn't came home and now there's an unidentified body being found so close by and immediately they began to fear the worst. They contacted the police who gave next to no details over the phone and just told the Kellys that they would come out. So for the next few hours, Judy and Tommy sat anxiously waiting. When officers did arrive, they'd done something which I personally have never heard of before. For. I guess when they had found this body they were able to recover a set of keys so when they arrived at the Kelly's house instead of knocking on the door or making themselves known they used the keys to see if it would unlock the front door and it did. For a very brief second, Julie felt this wave of relief over her. This was Thomas using his keys to come home and that it was just a nightmare that she could have even considered that this unidentified body could be her son. But as soon as she saw that it was officers walking through the door and not Thomas, her heart just sank. One of the first things that the officers say is, quote, it must be him then. No compassion or care, it is absolutely shocking. When Thomas's body was found, it was found burning inside the allotment, which was engulfed in flames, thus burning away a lot of potential evidence. Nearby his body there was a pot of glue and after investigators slash police saw this they just got tunnel vision deciding that this was how Thomas had died. After his post-mortem came back as inconclusive his death was ruled as accidental due to solvent abuse. Bear in mind that they had no evidence of this apart from that pot of glue being inside the allotment that he was found in. At this time glue sniffing was rife across the northeast and especially in these kind of smaller deprived areas which had a high unemployment rate. It was sadly not uncommon for these young boys to be found dead and abandoned or derelict places after abusing drugs, but the Kellys were absolutely certain that Thomas was not one of these boys. He was never known to be a drug user. He had no reason to be up at the allotments and what police are saying about Thomas and his death is just so far away from who Thomas actually was. The family pushed and pushed wanting answers, wanting to know what really happened to Thomas. But despite police admitting that his death was mysterious, they said it wasn't suspicious and so they closed the case. They had interviewed Stephen at one point about this fire and about this death, but he said he had no involvement, so he was just let go. 
For me, I think that the pot of glue was probably there because Stephen had been abusing it, not Thomas. Stephen had been abusing glue since he was 11 year old and at this point in time he's 22 so it's probably highly likely that it was him, not Thomas. And him either accidentally leaving it there or purposely leaving it there gave him the perfect cover because now Thomas's death was considered as accidental and not a homicide. Christmas and New Year's went by and as it does, life continued on for many. Thomas had attended Monk Weymouth School and a lot of the students there still felt his loss. Even though he was 18 and he didn't attend there anymore, he did have friends that still went there. One of these friends was 15 year old David Hansen. David was one of four children to Sheila and John Hansen. He was described as funny, smart, and a great brother and son. Unfortunately, I couldn't really find a lot of other information about David. However, I do know that he had chipped in some money for a wreath to go for Thomas's upcoming funeral. But sadly, he never got to attend to pay respects to his late friend. On the 8th of February, 1994, David's charred remains were found in an abandoned house on Roker Terrace. He had been missing since the 4th, so it's believed that that's when he died. In hindsight, we know that Stephen had managed to lure David to this abandoned house where he likely made a sexual advance, which David may have refused. And then Stephen killed him in order to keep his sexuality hidden. David had been strangled with a piece of cloth before his body was laid down on rubbish and wood and then ignited. This detail is a little bit unclear. I don't exactly know when David's body was ignited. It was said that he was found on the 8th by firemen who were putting out the fire so potentially he could have been murdered on the 4th and then Stephen had gone back to set his body on fire. The house where David's body was found was only a 10 minute walk away from the allotments where Thomas's body was found and you would think this would be enough to raise some alarm bells for police but it didn't. They believe that these two deaths were just a coincidence. They deem David's death as being from solvent abuse despite any evidence pointing towards this. They believe that his death was just another tragedy from the glue sniffing problem that they had at the time. Something that I didn't understand when I was researching this thought, and I just want to quickly point it out now, was that if the deaths were accidental, how were the police explaining away the fires? Did they think that these boys, Thomas and David, had had a fire on while abusing drugs, then died and then managed to catch themselves on fire? Couldn't really find out that detail, but it was something that was on my mind while I was researching this. David's autopsy came back as inconclusive and this was actually from a different pathologist to who done Thomas's autopsy. A local reporter did pick up on the similarities in these two deaths and went and spoke to police and in turn police said that Thomas's death was a tragedy, David's was a coincidence and quote, as long as there's not a third one. Stephen was briefly questioned following David's death and again was released. He's now putting it together that he's getting away with these murders, police are not catching him, he's not going to get any consequences for taking these innocent lives. And with the confidence he was now feeling from this, he began to escalate. On the 25th of February, just over two weeks after David Hansen's body was found, the body of 15 year old David Grief was found burning in an allotment only 50 yards away from where Thomas had been murdered. Because there are two Davids in this case now, when talking about them, I'm going to be using their full names. He had been out and about when he had crossed paths with Stephen. Stephen told David Grief that he had some weed that he wanted to share with them and with this promise he managed to successfully lure David to the abandoned allotments. Once here Stephen proceeded to rape David Grief and we know this because of evidence that was later found. He then forced David Grief to perform a sexual act on him before he strangled him to death using a belt and set his body on fire. 
David Grieve's body was found a few hours later and still, even after finding David Grieve literally with a belt around his neck, police brushed off the idea that he could have been murdered. Because Thomas had attended Monk William Mouth School and both Davids attended there, this kind of gave police further evidence that all of these deaths was from the glue sniffing craze, even more so because both Davids had been classmates and good friends. So now we have three deaths all within four months all under similar circumstances, all postmortems came back as inconclusive, all of them were found within close proximity to each other and all of them were set on fire but police are still not putting it together. The Kelly, Hansen and Grief family were not going to take this ruling lying down. The three families united to create a force to push back to be loud about what they were saying and began talking to the press and anyone who could get their message out there to create a campaign for police to reopen these cases and reinvestigate them but properly this time. They were sick of their innocent son's name being dragged through the mud and being stereotyped and being brushed with these people that they were nothing alike. Through this time, the families really connected and made a very strong bond. They were able to lean on each other. They were there for each other because each one of them knew what the other one was going through. The hard work and the determination of the families finally paid off when a brand new lead detective reopened and began to reinvestigate the case. This was a man named Dave Wilson. He was very well respected within his field. He was known to be very thorough and one of the best at his job. A brand new set of eyes was exactly what this case needed and the family were very grateful for Dave. Lindsay, who again was Thomas's sister, would later say that he always kept the families in the loop. He really genuinely wanted to know what happened to the boys and he was one of the only people that actually listened to the families so they were very glad to have him there. He began by looking over the pathologists and the autopsies report and from this requested to have the bodies of Thomas, David Hansen and David Grief exhumed for re-examination. This was approved and in August 1994, two of the country's best senior pathologists conducted another postmortem on the three young boys. It was determined that all three of the victims had the same cause of death, which was strangulation. This ruling meant that they now had to open a murder investigation and because of all the similarities in the circumstances of each boy's death and because they all now had the same cause of death, they were able to link and tie all of the deaths together and it was deemed that the murders had been committed by a single individual. During the examination, pathologists were able to extract some semen DNA that was found in the stomach of David Grief. They ran this DNA through the National database to see if there was a match. The following month in September they were notified that there was a match and they now had a name for their triple killer. The DNA they found belonged to a local man named Stephen Greveson. Luckily for officers at the time that they discover this Stephen is actually in prison. He had been serving time since March of that year after he had gone into one of his local chippies. He was armed, he threatened the employee behind the till to open it. He then drained it of all its cash and then fled but obviously he was caught and now he's in prison for it. Along with this DNA, investigators were also able to find a fingerprint that belonged to Stephen in the abandoned house where David Grief was found. Now this didn't necessarily scream murder but it did show that he had access to that house and he had been in there at one point. Investigators realised that witnesses had also came forward and told the police that they had seen David Grief walking with Stephen on the day that he was murdered. So along with the DNA that they had found in David Grief's stomach they had a heap of circumstantial evidence, a lot more than what I just relayed but they had it. Stephen was arrested in his cell and when families were notified of the arrest it didn't come as a surprise to them. Lindsay, again Thomas's sister, said, quote, When Greveson was arrested for the murder we weren't shocked at all because it was what we were fighting for for months. We knew it was him, we knew those boys had done nothing wrong, we knew that someone had done that to them. Stephen's triple murder trial began at Leeds Crown Court in January 1996 where he entered a plea of not guilty. 
He maintained his innocence throughout the whole trial and was probably cocky enough to think that he was actually going to get away with it. In his mind, investigators had no evidence at all. He believed that all evidence was incinerated in the fires that he had started. Plus, he had been questioned after every single murder and then was let go. So to him, he's thinking, why is this time any different? While in court, Stephen would obnoxiously laugh out loud. He would wave at the victim's families. He would flip them off, stick his fingers up at them and he would pull faces at them just being the most ignorant disgusting disrespectful person ever the trial lasted a long six weeks and it took the jury only four hours to deliberate they found stephen greaveson guilty of the murder of thomas kelly david hansen and david grief when this verdict was read, the gallery erupted with cheers. The family stood up and they were so happy that they now had this justice. Stephen, however, kept his head down and remained silent. He would go on to be sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 35 years to serve. And I thought that 35 years was a little bit low. You would expect for one single murder to get between 25 plus years. So 35 for three years seems a little bit light for me, but that's what he was given. And he was sent to full Sutton Prison in Yorkshire to serve out his sentence. During his time behind bars, Stephen apparently began to feel a hint of remorse. He wrote letters to each of the victim's families kind of begging for forgiveness, offering to take his own life in order to get their forgiveness. I couldn't find the full letters anywhere, but I did find little excerpts of each letter. So they are as follows. In the letter to Thomas Kelly's family, he wrote, quote, I would gladly give you a gun to shoot me. Would that make a difference? In the letter to David Hansen's family, he wrote, quote, I took a piece of your heart away from you that night. I'm sorry. Why? I don't know. Forgive me. So sorry for destroying your family. In his letter to David Grief's family, he wrote, quote, I will, non-abbreviated, KMS for yous. If that will help you forgive me, I'm not lying. Now, this is where today's case should end, but we're not quite finished yet. In 2000, Dave Wilson, who was that new detective, began looking through some of Sunderland's cold cases, and this included the murder of a 14-year-old boy named Simon Martin. Stephen's DNA was found in the abandoned derelict house that Simon Martin was found in, and because he's now serving time for a triple murder of young boys, it's not outlandish to think that maybe he was responsible for this one as well. So investigators slash officers went to the prison to speak to Stephen, and he profusely denied any involvement with this murder whatsoever. Because they had pretty much no evidence, they just sort of had a hunch that Stephen was responsible. They couldn't arrest him or charge him, so off they went. Spoiler alert though, it comes as no surprise that Stephen was lying through his back teeth and he had murdered Simon, so I'm going to take you all back and talk about that. Simon Martin was 14 year old in 1990. On the 18th of May, he asked his parents, Robert and Jane, if he could go to the park and play football with his friends for a little bit. They said that he could, but he had to be back by six o'clock for his tea. He made his way over the park to meet his friends, and that's when Stephen got his eye on him. At this time, Stephen is 19, so this is before the triple murders. Stephen and Simon started playing football together for a little bit. If you remember, I said at the beginning of the video, Stephen was quite a talented player, so Simon was probably Probably having a lot of fun playing with Stephen. After playing for a little bit, Stephen lured little Simon to an abandoned building. Once here, he sexually assaulted poor little Simon and after began threatening, shouting, screaming at him to keep his mouth shut about what had happened. But despite the threats, Stephen was so overcome with fear that Simon would speak and tell someone that he decided the only way to silence him would be to kill him. He began by strangling Simon. He then picked up a brick that was nearby and began striking poor Simon over the head with it repeatedly. 
this was a very angry murder the scene was saturated with blood and it was horrific 6 p.m quickly rolled round and simon still wasn't home i don't know if him missing his curfew was a normal typical thing because his parents did wait a few hours before robert set out to try and find him that very small feeling of frustration of having to go out and look for him because he had missed his curfew soon turned to fear when robert could not find his son any Anywhere. Feeling lost, he returned back home and rang the police to report Simon missing. It would take over a week for Simon's body to be found in the abandoned building. He was found half naked by two other children on the 26th of May 1990. Immediately, officers knew that this was a murder, so they launched a murder investigation. The only evidence they could find was a fingerprint that was in blood. This fingerprint was run through the database and flagged up as a match to a 16-year-old boy. This boy was questioned and outright profusely denied any involvement with it whatsoever. However, it did make it all the way to court, where this boy was eventually cleared of Simon's murder. It was determined that him along with many other local kids would play in that house quite often and it was a very unfortunate coincidence that one of his fingerprints ended up in some blood. This led investigators back to square one. They interviewed Stephen as they had received some intelligence that Stephen was seeing with Simon prior to his murder. And I know this is weird. I know that a 19 year old has no business with a 14 year old playing together, hanging out, whatever. But Stephen was openly known to hang around with boys who were much younger than him because he liked having power over them. He liked being, you know, the authority figure and he liked the control that he could have over these young boys. Boys. When he was questioned by the police about Simon's murder, he denied any involvement, even going so far as to say he had never been in that abandoned house and police took his word for it and just let him go. Simon's case sadly very quickly went cold after that and it would be cold for a long time. Stephen went unpunished and because of this he was able to proceed to commit the triple murders between November 1993 and February 1994. In 2012, over a decade after he was last questioned about Simon's murder, Stephen out of nowhere decided to confess to it, claiming that the murder had been haunted haunting him saying quote it was haunting me for 20 years i have self-harmed because of it it drove me crazy and i needed to give the family peace of mind and peace of mind for myself as well i can't move forwards unless this has been said he was haunted by this murder, yet he never confessed to it. He never gave on that he was involved. He could have confessed straight away when it first happened, which would have prevented him doing three more murders. Or he could have confessed a decade earlier when he was questioned about it again, when he was already never really going to get out of prison for the triple murders. But he didn't, so I don't really buy that he was haunted by it. The trial for Simon's murder began on the 14th of October 2013 at Newcastle Crown Court where Stephen ended a plea of not guilty claiming Simon's murder was an accident. During the trial he detailed murdering Simon saying quote After it was finished I got scared and started strangling him then. I don't know, I didn't let go. The next thing he was on the bed and I got scared and I think there was a rock or something and I smashed his head in. Simon's parents sat in the gallery and all around them supporting them through probably one of the most hardest time of their lives were the families of Thomas Kelly, David Hansen and David Grief. After a nine day trial, Stephen was found guilty of Simon's murder and was handed another life sentence with a minimum of 35 years to serve. While doing my research, I read something about Kathy again. If you remember, she's Stephen's mom. I spoke about her right at the beginning of the video. I read something about her that while Stephen was in prison, she would actually smuggle drugs in for him and she was caught and she did have to serve six months behind bars because of it. But it was just crazy to me that she was smuggling drugs into prison for Stephen. When she was caught and asked about it, she said that it was because Stephen complained he couldn't sleep, so she thought by smuggling drugs in, it would help him sleep. That was just wild. I still can't get over that. And that is today's case, a case about a serial killer who took the lives of four innocent young boys to disguise his sexuality. 
it's awful because I know firsthand how struggling with your sexuality and coming to terms with it can be such a hard thing and how coming out can be scary and it can be a huge deal but it still doesn't justify murder. Simon Martin, Thomas Kelly, David Hansen and David Grief did not deserve to be murdered to keep Stephen's secret. They were young, nice, pleasant boys who were well liked and they deserve to live a long, happy life. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you have enjoyed today's video and you would like to listen to more true crime cases covered by me, I have plenty on my channel that you can go ahead and watch right now. I also do shorter true crime videos over on my TikTok account. You can find the link for that in the description box below. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts. Thank you all so much again for sitting and listening with me. I really genuinely appreciate the support that you all show me on each and every one of my videos. So I'm going to leave today at that and I will see you all on my next one.